Let me just say a few things about John. John was one of our most popular live streamed speakers at TEDx Sand Hill Road Women. We had just a little taste of him then, but I cherry picked him out of a different TEDx, the TEDx San, um, DC event, because I knew that you would want it. And then I heard from you that you wanted more. So we were so lucky to be able to get him right on the heels of his book coming out. It's just come out, so he's, he's been running around speaking all over the place to Starbucks and other places. So he's a two-time best-selling author, a journalist, a consultant, and a social theorist. His research, writing, and interviews have appeared in the Harvard Business Review, The Economist, The Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, CNBC, NPR, Forbes, and many others. As Chief Insights Officer at Young and Rubicum, he oversees the world's largest database of brands and consumer behavior and is a pioneer in the use of data to identify social change. So John has his finger on how the pulse of the emerging trends, and the one we're going to hear about tonight is how feminine traits and values are gaining currency in the world. John's research and stories will affirm and embolden us to realize that this is our time. Will you be my agent? That is so awesome. I get um, asked that a lot. <laughs> thank you so much for having me. It is, it is a great honor. And um, Wendy and I became sort of BFFs on Twitter and email, and we are champions of the same cause. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about um, this evening. We're going to talk about change. We're going to talk about exciting, fundamental change we think that's happening in the world that is going to set in motion some really, really big promise and progress for the, for the future of women and girls. And I'm going to approach it not only as a middle-aged guy, but I'm going to approach it from the perspective of data, because there hasn't really been data that's been brought into this discussion. So much of it's been sort of theoretical. And um, one of the things someone asked me recently, why did you choose the Athena doctrine? And if you know, remember your Greek mythology, Athena was the goddess of war, but also the goddess of wisdom. And she preferred uh, to address things through thinking and strategy, but she was also the goddess of math. And I thought, well, I'm kind of geeky. I like data. This is like a ma match made in heaven. Um, I talked a little bit about this before, but I, one of the themes that I wanted to kind of touch on to kind of get started was um, this question of why do we act feminine in times of crisis? You know, we saw this incredible compassion that happened uh, last week all over the country with the tragedies in Boston. You know, how evil was met with, with incredible heroics and incredible sense of, of good and optimism. And I guess that was one of the themes that we saw as we traveled the world. One of the many, many people we encountered were, was this man, Nagato Kimura. And um, as I explained in my story, he had a fish cannery and he lost his cannery, it was destroyed during the events of, of the hurricane and the tsunami it, back in uh, March 11th of two years ago. Um, I ate canned mackerel with him and, and he started to tell me this story about how these cans started to wash up on shore after the, the hurricane or after the tsunami. And people in Tokyo loved this story so they decided to come up and help out. They loved the brand. So think of a brand that you absolutely love, you know, you can't live without. That, this was like the Grey Poupon of Tokyo, I guess. Um, and the really great thing about it was is they went and took these cans and stocked them on the store shelves bare. And what happened was people just took their Sharpies, their magic markers, and went in and just started to basically put up these messages of hope and inspiration. There were things like help each other Japan and we will thr thrive and strive. And, you know, you saw, you saw the Japanese flag as a symbol, the rising sun. And, you know, what ended up happening is these ordinary people basically recovered 800,000 cans of his million cans that he had lost to help him rebuild his factory. And the factories are being rebuilt right now. So it was just people just making a gesture, just trying to connect, trying to bring compassion and, and connectivity into their lives. Um, but we also spent time in Iceland. And we loved meeting Hala. She is uh, a partner. She and her... her um, partner who's also a woman, they run this capital firm, Otter Capital. And she was like the lone voice of reason in Reykjavik when all these guys basically broke the country. And um, she attributed it to what she described as the great big penis syndrome, where she said, 
All these guys just couldn't see the speculation and what was unfolding before them. Her capital fund, her company was the only one basically that sort of thrived and succeeded through the crisis because she brought in balance and reasoning. She couldn't get these guys to change. And what was a pity in all of it is that they all knew each other. If you go to Reykjavik, it's like this tiny little town. It's like smaller than Minneapolis. But this thriving sort of capital business that she had was set against this incredible destruction. And I guess um, this reason and balance, I think, is interesting because the thing that we saw as we traveled around the world were these sort of different places that were in crisis was met with this opposite sort of sense of goodness. And that's what the Athena Doctrine is about. It's about this idea of an emergent form of leadership. It's the idea that you can be yourself, that you can reach out, you can bring collaboration, empathy, flexibility, the basic human traits that are inside all of us, men and women, you can bring those to bear to really do some amazing things. I'll say up front, this is not yet widespread, but that's what really makes it cool. There's some really awesome men and women that are doing this. Um, it's not just a millennial concept, and it's not just an American concept. It's people that we saw all over the world that were taking these things on to make it happen. Um, so real briefly, a little bit about our study. Uh, as I said, we approached it uh, from data, and guys love data. You gotta have the ROI on the data. But um, that was really important to us. We said, what is going on here? And so what we did is we gathered data all over the world. We purposely tried to find a really broad mix of countries from cultural to economics to sort of um, religious um, issues as well, just to try to get a really good sense of people. All the data was nationally representative, so this is sort of citizens in their countries. But on top of that, we also spent uh, the last two years traveling around the world. I had hair when I started this project, I think. <laughs> um, but you know, we went, we went to all these amazing places, and I'm gonna talk about a few of them, but we, we, of, of two of the more interesting countries we went to were, were Colombia and Kenya. You know, countries where really thorny, systemic, huge problems were being tackled by people using these Athena traits. And that's one of the key things people ask me, like, is this all about soft skills and just being soft? And I'm like, these people were fierce. I mean, these people were really going after tough problems. They just were finding a different way to solve the problem. So yeah, we talked to everybody, a lot of NGOs. Um, we talked to a lot of diplomats, a lot of politicians, and I'll tell you a few of their stories in a second. But one of the things we did is we saw this macro view of pessimism around the world. And it was this idea that sort of, what's going on with life? You know, will life be better for my children than it is for me? And, and a sense of concern about that. Also, the, this question of power inside corporations, this was magnified when we talked to millennials who nearly 100% of them really have this mistrust to sort of large institutions and corporations. But also the question around empathy. This has been a really dominant theme in a lot of my research that I've been doing over the last four or five years where people really are concerned about whether their leaders care, whether they actually really are out to care for people and, and whether they feel like they've got their backs. And people don't feel that way. And then this question of sort of society's basic fairness, you know, is another sort of dominant sort of form of criticism. And, you know, the thing we thought was interesting is sort of underneath this, they were kind of having this global referendum on men, as I describe it. You know, two thirds of, of people here were dissatisfied with the conduct of men by and large, particularly when you take out China and Canada. Canada is awesome. I'm going to Canada on Monday because Canadian men must be doing something right. They had like the best levels, highest levels of satisfaction. But, but seriously, when we take out the Canadian data and the China data, and I am worried candidly a little bit about reporting bias of Chinese citizens on a lot of these types of questions. When we take those out, you were talking about 75 to 80% of people feeling um, this level of dissatisfaction. And then it gets really magnified with millennials. We were so interested in that, the idea that young men and women really feel differently about gender and about differences in people and about these divides that have sort of dominated our social narratives for so long. Um, very interestingly that there was this generation gap in really masculine countries, you know, like Germany, South Korea, and India, um, sort of double digit gaps between millennials and sort of men over 50 you know, whether they were really getting what was going on. So we started to get this portrait of this incumbency, you know, this question of these masculine structures. Really importantly, it's not about the end of men and like, let's all hate all men. It was actually men that were actually dissatisfied with these structures as well, right? We had 79% of Japanese men frustrated with the conduct of men. 
in their country. And when we went and did all these interviews, we started to see questions about fairness, about you know, the ability to be able to hold on to a job. You know, one of the dominant themes in Japanese culture has been around sort of guaranteed employment, and that's all been washed away over the, over the course of the last 20 years. So a lot of these things were sort of in, in play when we talked to people about politics, talked to them about religion. You started to get these questions of these codes of conduct and control and aggression that were really frustrating a lot of people. But we asked this really great question. We said, um, you know, two thirds of people around the world thought the world would be a better place if men thought more like women. And inside that, it was really interesting to note high levels of sort of citizens in countries that were sort of quote unquote very masculine. You know, Japan, South Korea, again, Germany and, and India. And again, high levels of sort of millennials sort of thinking this way. So what we did is Michael and I went off and we started to think more clearly about this. And we said, all right, if we're going to wade into this discussion of gender, what does that really mean? And how do we approach it from a researcher standpoint? So what we did was we basically divided the sample of 64,000 people in half. We asked half the sample to sort of gender a whole bunch of different human traits, things like energetic, creative, empathetic, expressive, stylish, et cetera. We asked them to just say, do you think they're masculine? Do you think they're feminine or neither? So we did this in 13 countries around the world. But then what we did is we took the other half of the sample, no gendering whatsoever. We basically said, OK, you've got these challenges that you think exist in the world. How do you take those human traits? And how do we think about those to solve in our problems? What does it mean to have the most important things drive success, leadership, morality, and happiness? And what was really interesting is that when we started to model the data, that's where we started to see that overall, people are placing a greater premium on what could be called traditionally feminine traits and values. And I use that to start to talk about the importance of what really needs to happen today. What we started to see was this rise in leadership. And people were focused on these feminine values. They were interested in very sort of focused <laughs> ideas around empathy and around selflessness. And very, very interesting to us was sort of looking at, first and foremost, this idea of being expressive. Wendy just talked about this, be yourself. Like, put yourself out there. This genuine, authentic leadership was the single most important thing that people thought was most correlated to modern leadership. So don't be tone deaf. Don't go out and just simply you know, lead because you, you want to lead and you want to get a job. Talk about why you want to lead. Put your heart out there. Really, really connect with people, whether it's managing a team or whether it's you know, running a country. But we also saw how interestingly highly correlated with modern leadership in the ideal eyes of, of the world today was this planning for the future. And if you think about it, we're frustrated with all of this sort of fighting. We can't get to any grand bargains. It's, everything is about partisanship. And you know, we can't really get in and get at the underlying infrastructural problems. So I'm going to talk about that when we talk about some of the innovative people we met. But then also, really interesting things, aggressive and, and pride, which you would think are just keys to the driver, driver, manager, CEO, got to get it done. Look how least correlated they are to leadership compared to other things like flexibility and patience and being intuitive. So again, it's not saying that you just have to be soft, that that's going to be the key, because it's still important to be decisive and resilient, to be strong. But you know, as Wendy talked about, how does that strength get manifested in being human, right? in being empathetic, which was very much a key sort of driver of what people saw in modern leadership, as well as being selfless. So we kind of got interested in these like, narratives that this is sort of what people want because they think it's in short supply. And you know, someone asked me before this, you know, how do you think about this from marketing? Well, what marketing is always looking for is opportunities and gaps, whether you're a politician or you're starting a business or you're an entrepreneur. For a leader, this is entrepreneurial. These are gaps in the marketplace that, that people are clamoring for. So I'm going to show you just a few examples, and then we're going to have a, a bit of a, a Q&A and a discussion. But I, I thought it's worth showing some of the amazing thinkers. And again, the, the conditions underneath a lot of the way in which these Athena thinkers worked were very, very tough, thorny, intractable problems. And they thought about them in different ways. So this is uh, Sylvia Lolly. We have a whole chapter in the book on Peru and Colombia. Incredibly interesting countries right now. Very dynamic, very, very much changing. But Sylvia runs the women's house um, in Lima. And for decades, there has basically been a blind eye toward domestic abuse with women. 
The police basically ignore it. If you've read anything about it, it's basically sort of been a, a thing that's just swept under the rug. It's just not valued. She got really mad, and she also got mad because the police force was all men, and so they saw this as a women's issue. They didn't really connect with it. So she said, screw it. I'm going to start my own police force. And she did. <laughs> she, she, created her, she created her own police force, privately trained, and then she was able to prove to the government that there was something like 60% or 62 or 63 percent improvement in reduction in corruption of the police force if you integrated women into the police force, which she then did. It's just one woman, just out there getting stuff done. And you know, the thing that was powerful is she's now lobbied. It's an incredible, she's a great woman, incredible woman. And she's now lobbied um, the governments and the constitutional committees there to basically um, work on these domestic issue abuses. So she's lobbied for legislation. So she's an incredibly powerful woman. Um, we also saw these really interesting themes of, of women and men finding very low-tech solutions to really big, thorny problems. And so Rose Goslingo, this is in Kenya, and she's a, 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 a daughter of, of incredible sort of length of focus in, in Kenya. And what she talked about was this idea around how we could help farmers, poor farmers, basically find ways to afford crop insurance. The problem was is that to have an adjuster come out and see if you lost your crops would cost you more than the policy. You, know, you just couldn't afford it. The margins on being able to afford um, assurance for a, a, a Kenyan farmer is just way too expensive. So she designed this low-tech series of weather satellites. But what she did is she connected it through Safaricom's M-Pesa, it's this text-based messaging platform that drives 70% of the Kenyan economy, right? One of the things that's made Kenya so interesting and exciting is that you can move money around on text. So something incredibly low-tech has become this high-tech thing where sort of the, the whole theme behind it is that the country is sort of jumping infrastructure. And what Bob Collimore wants to do, working with Rose, is that they're starting to create all these innovative businesses that are creating communities using these forums. So this was a barrier before, right? Currency would basically be, it was corrupt, people would, there was just um, extortion, but through text you could actually create these little safe forms of, of capitalism. So she's been able over the last three years to basically create and sustain 12,000 farmers together working to be able to afford insurance. Very much interesting themes in Kenya around community. You know, we met another group of women that were running a savings club one of the big issues, again, in, in, in Kenya and Africa is that there's oftentimes a situation where men will take the money that they've earned and go off and drink and spend it some other way rather than supporting the families. So a group of women created a savings club, and the box had all the money, and there were four locks. It was called the four lock box, which is all around this sense of sort of community. So very interesting circles of trust being built there. Um, let's hear one for the guys, uh, <laughs> particularly the bald guys. They rule. Um, this is Dr. Ayad Maddish, and I just loved how he thought differently about his industry. He um, has a PhD in virology, right? He is like one of the smartest guys I've ever met. He kept looking down, like he wouldn't look me in the eyes. He was a super humble guy, and, and he just talked about how scientific research was sort of messed up. And I said, asked him why, and he got into this story, and we were in... Um, in Berlin, it was freezing. I remember the day, it was totally cold, and he was like sitting there in his sweater, having a cup of tea, and saying, I kept getting stuck in my experiments. And when he went to his colleagues for help, they were like, dude, why are you admitting you don't know something? You look really bad. You just, I'm just, and so he basically sort of had one of those, um, what's it called when they give you the, yeah, an intervention. He had an intervention from his medical researcher buddies that said, you really look foolish. And he was like, that's just silly. I want to be more efficient. So the enemy of medical research is time, right? And he was just trying to find ways to, to shortcut. So he thought if he could find someone to help him explain and work through a problem in a matter of hours rather than a matter of weeks, that would be good scientific research. So he moved to Berlin. He got some friends together. And they started sort of a, I guess you'd say a Quora Facebook meets sort of research for scientists. It's called ResearchGate. It's really cool. Go, go check them out. It's researchgate.org. But in the span of the last three years, he now has 2 million members. 
from 200 countries working on 800,000 different papers. And when we asked him, like, what do you want to do with all this? He's like, I just wanted to get scientists out of the cubicles. I realized that there were a whole bunch of other scientists, men and women that were just like me, that were curious, that were collaborative, seriously also competitive, but it wasn't about the me, 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 I've got to go issue the paper and look good at the conference and I've only solved this much of the problem. So his goal is really to crowdsource um, a Nobel Prize and have a whole bunch of people's names attached to it. <laughs> cool, right? He's an awesome, he's an awesome guy. I mean, he's successful. That's the other theme in these things. This isn't just feel good kumbaya stuff. I mean, he's got two or three rounds of funding and this is a serious you know, business that he's building. Um, the other really interesting theme that we saw, and Wendy talked a lot about sort of leading in a new way. I think this is a winning in a new way. This is sort of a concept around this idea of winning is plural. And um, similar to, to Dr. Mattish, who sort of used his vulnerability to lead, this is the idea of thinking long term about multiple positive outcomes for the people that you engage with. So, so much of, of in the masculine sort of structure of business is zero sum game, right? You win, I lose, I win, you lose. Well, that just becomes sort of tactical and it doesn't really build sustainable things oftentimes. Um, think about our elections, you know, it goes back and forth and back and forth. Are we really solving any big problems? Well, what, what social finance is, is an example of this idea of winning is plural. So Emily Bolton, who um, was cursing me as I was taking her photo, she was eight and a half months pregnant, and we're like, Emily, you look awesome. What are you worried about? Um, she runs this incredible um, group that do social impact bonds for social finance in the UK. So the way they work is that they're geared toward lowering future government costs. So what they do is they will issue a bond where, in fact, on one example, which was helping uh, prisoners reintegrate back into society, if the rate of reoffending prisoners dropped below a certain number, I think it was like 7%, the private investors would profit. Well, what ended up happening is they created these models for incentives where private investors became social activists. Because if you've got your money in the bond, you sure as heck want these prisoners back into society, you know, <laughs> let's go. Um, and so they got involved in um, job training, drug counseling, in sort of an enlightened self-interest. And in their program over the first year with this, this pilot, it's been actually three years running now, they've been able to you know, get underneath that in a way that all three parties sort of win. So we think those are interesting ideas about leaders. How do you think long term about your, not only your, your sort of allies, but your potential adversaries? And how do you create sort of paths to sort of success and, and prosperity for, for more than just yourself? Um, Talk about fierce. This is Major General Orna Barbavai. Um, she's the highest ranking woman in military organizations anywhere in the world. She is incredible. And um, when I asked her, she's, she's with the Israeli Defense Force. She's Major General. And when I asked her how she approached military strategy, she said, from the perspective of a mother. And I asked her, explain. <laughs> and she just said, you know, Mothers can see lots of angles on situations. Mothers have a broader um, view on the world than what a soldier sees looking through a gun sight. And you need to accept, assess the consequences of your actions before you take them, because you need to think about engagement, because there's going to be something that's going to happen on the back end. But she also said, when forced to defend and forced to fight, no one's more fierce than a mother. Um, and my wife agrees, my 10-year-old. <laughs> But uh, I thought what was really interesting is that she piloted this program where she was trying to reduce the rates of hostility at the checkpoints by building the steam into the people that were going through these checkpoints. And this is obviously a chaotic, complex, fluid environment over there. And I was, I was struck with the time I spent in Israel. You know, talking about a country the size of New Jersey with all these other different sort of components that are moving around. But what they've been able to do is reduce the rates of hostility by not only putting women at the checkpoints, but by training all the soldiers to be more empathetic. And one of the things she did is she stationed two of her daughters at the checkpoints at the Syrian Gaza Strip to sort of make this point. It's an all compulsory you know, a force. Fascinating to me too in Israeli culture that with all the militaristic sort of things around it, you have incredibly interesting sense of equality in certain circles, particularly with women and their focus on the armed forces. Um, now, some of them are just ridiculously fun and they're making money. This is Granny Holly. And what other kind of job do you get when you get to go up into the British countryside and drink tea with Granny Holly while she knits? 
but that's what Michael and I did. Um, she is one of the platoons of grandmothers for this startup called Granny's Inc. And Granny's Inc. is this wildly successful little sort of, I describe it as Etsy meets AARP business, <laughs> um, founded by this just crazy charming young uh, British woman named Katie Moat. And she's got these platoons of grandmothers that are making a little bit of extra money on the side, hand knitting scarves and hats for all these hipsters to wear in East London. Um, it's become a really successful brand in, in the UK, but what's really interesting about it is you can go onto their website and you can pick out your own granny, right? So everybody's adopting these grandmothers um, all over the UK, but Holly said that they're also developing these relationships. So it's sort of customer service at a new super emotional level. And what's cool about their, their sort of theme is it's Granny Zinc, there's wisdom in the wool. So speaking to nurturing, to empathy, and to, and to legacy, and sort of a, a powerful new in, insight into a business model. We saw these business models all over the world. You know, we spent time with Tim Kunde, who created Friendsurance, which is a social network around insurance. His insight was people would defraud an institution, but they wouldn't defraud their friends. And so you go in and you buy car insurance, health insurance, life insurance with your friends into circles. Um, we also really enjoyed um, our time with Leo Risky. He's a cultural attache at the Fellowsus, which is Danish for House for Everyone. So this is the first shared embassy in the world to the five Nordic nations of Denmark, Norway, Iceland, Sweden, Finland. And what was so cool is when I was there with him, this is the center circle. It sort of looks like this vast open structure. You just walk right in. There's not any big walls or barbed wire fences or anything. And you know, you, you have to get checked in when you go in, but once you're in, you can go back and forth. It's like, oh, we're in Sweden, now we're in Denmark, now we're in Norway. All the buildings are just open, it's like a campus. And what they've done is they've created this sort of group Nordic approach to diplomacy, not only for economic development, but for policy. And what's happened is this has become sort of the cultural place where all the diplomats going into Berlin hang out. And literally right across the street is the Syrian embassy. I'm leaving my meetings with him and it's the Syrian embassy that's shuttered and covered in graffiti. So one political you know, sort of framework around openness and collaboration and, and one that's, that's you know, different in very many ways. Um, you know, it was like this sort of all over the world and I, I mentioned a little bit about Colombia we were just struck with the excitement and the energy that is in Colombia right now as they are trying to take on really systemic, seemingly intractable problems. One of the things the Athena thinkers were doing was just figuring out if we just incremental and we just go the same way we've always gonna go, we're not gonna get anything fixed. So they're putting their hearts out into their problems and trying to solve them in a different way. That's what Catalina does. She um, runs Mi Sangre Foundation, which is the My Blood Foundation which has helped 30,000 um, ex-rebels, many of whom were just young children that were sort of drug off into the mountains and jungles to become uh, Revolutionary Armed Forces uh, members, helping them reintegrate back into society. Um, one of the stories that we talk about in the book is that the rebels got together and put on a uh, drag fashion show for a whole bunch of people that they had once basically victimized. Um, her, her programs are, are very, very interesting. It's this idea of empathy, contrition, respect, and sort of seeing both sides of situations. Um, this was a huge theme around Colombia. I mean, we spent time with um, the municipal government. There's a whole bunch of great stories in Colombia, but another one was the fact that in Medellin, two-thirds of the operating budget for the municipal government is focused on people under 30, right? They figure out the only way they're going to break this cycle of despair and of violence and poverty is to really give kids a, a chance. So it's free digital uh, libraries, free education, healthcare, and all sorts of other infrastructure that supports them. Um, I hope you guys would, in, would have Shai come out and talk to you sometime. He's, he's based in Pasadena. He is um, a true hero and a great Athena thinker. Um, he is one of these just great, great education innovators that are taking advantage of the social sort of sharing economy. Um, he, he's based in Pasadena. He's, the business is um, in both in Tel Aviv, Pasadena, but he just moved all of his servers over into the West Bank. And he talks about how superior the technology is. We saw a lot of that collaboration between Israelis and Palestinians in the era of technology. Um, but what Shai has done 
is she's created the world's first tuition-free university. It's called University of the People. Check it out. Um, what's really amazing about it is that 80% of their students live in the bottom 20% of GDP-producing countries. So what he's done is he's created a curriculum that's global. It's computer science and business administration. But um, does anybody have a teacher among them and their family or friends? You know about teachers. My mom is an English professor from, from IU, and she's still teaching me. Teachers want to teach, right? Even when they're teaching, they're, te you know, they're off, they're teaching. My mom's like still teaching. She's like, I don't know about this phrase in this book. Yeah, I think it's a passive pronoun or something. Um, <laughs> But what they've been able to do is connect 2,500 educators from the best schools in the country and around the world, including Stanford, um, to basically teach these kids. And that has created an incredible environment. Um, we also spent time with Maria Ziv in Sweden. She runs the at Sweden Twitter handle. Their business problem was, what do people think about um, Sweden? She said two things, blonde people and ABBA. And <laughs> so, they wanted to show a more rich portrait of life about Sweden, so they gave up the National Sweden account on Twitter. You gotta follow them, it's at Sweden. The national account for the, for the country over to an individual citizen to tweet basically every week to talk about what life is like in Sweden. Um, and then uh, lastly, Maria Domanicki, just this incredible woman. We just saw how clever and plucky a lot of these thinkers were. They were being innovative, and you wouldn't associate innovation with a European technocrat, but that's what she is. And she had this empathy for the plight of fishermen that most bureaucrats wouldn't care about. But that was because of her upbringing. She was raised in Crete and loved and understood the fishing culture and understood the relationship of the society to fishermen and, and to the waters. And so she's the perfect person to be the EU commissioner of, of maritime affairs and fisheries. The big problem was is you had all these unemployed fishermen because of overstocked fishing in Europe. But they also had a problem with pollution, these plastic barges of waste and debris that are out in the ocean. So she decided to send the fishermen out to fish for plastic. She basically created a price for the, for the price of plastic in a way that would supplement their income and help sort of address issues of, of pollution. Very clever. And then lastly, Eriko Yamaguchi, um, perhaps one of my most favorite interviews of our 100 interviews we did. But this is a woman who has known adversity her entire life. Um, she was bullied so badly um, when she was in school that her parents took her out of grade school for about four, I think maybe five years. She got out, she took up kickboxing um, to be tough, but she also never lost that feeling of empathy and she didn't want other people to be treated the way she had been treated. And she, during that time she was um, at home, she started to develop a knack for fashion. So she went on and told me she went on to Yahoo one day, typed in what's the poorest country, discovered it was Bangladesh, and she went there and got a fashion degree at Brack University. Now, Bangladesh has been in the news this week because of the conditions of the garment workers and what's happened there tragically. She went at this in a different way. She went at trying to teach an entire factory that she leased of all men how to make high quality handbags. They had been making sacks for grain and potatoes. The first thing she did is she doubled, or raised their wages by 50%. She said, look at only high quality handcrafted uh, people are gonna make this kind of money. So she imbued them with esteem. Next thing she did, she gave them ID badges with their, with their photo. They'd never had a photo of themselves before. Over the course of sort of the, la the next three years, she basically built out this factory. And today she's got seven stores in Tokyo and pays double the average of wages. Of, of workers in Bangladesh. So these are the things that we saw around the world. And I guess what I want to stress into this entire argument is I think there's a big place to think about this, that we all have a spectrum of masculinity and femininity inside us. We all need these things to thrive in the years ahead. And that is what's really driving the future. Because when you see not only about GDP, we're balanced. We're balanced as a society. In our data, People that think in a more masculine and feminine way have higher levels of GDP growth. But yet at the same time, equally importantly, is that we have higher levels of quality of life. Right? This is, these are important imperatives for us. So that's the thing we're going to get on now and talk about with Wendy and, and open this up for discussion. But we really believe the power in this is thinking through men and women, realizing that we have these feminine values. They're going to be essential to a operating system of a world that's far more collaborative, 
that's far more interdependent and far more transparent. And these are going to be sort of a guiding oxygen environment that's going to help us start to move things along. Um, that's the essence of the Athena Doctrine. Again, it's by no means um, a dominant thing. I wouldn't say that you know, the majority of companies are like this. I go through a lot of corporations. But it's emerging. And I think that's what's exciting about it. And the more that we can advocate for the rights of women and girls by having men model this approach, having men understand that these are values that, are, that have a currency that are going to have competitive advantage, this is a place we, we think that might be a great place to start. I'll leave you a last note uh, to say that all proceeds of the book um, support the United Nations Girl Up um, campaign. It's an awesome organization. Please go onto their Facebook page and like it and support them. The, the work they're doing is incredible, and it's sort of minting the next generation of leaders, which is what this is all about. Thank you. Thank you.